Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Jenna Sidhu. I'm from Simon Fraser University in Dr. Michael Silverman's lab. And today I will be talking about axon outgrowth in a patient model of Kiplinia associated neurological disorder. So to start, in case you don't know, Simon Fraser University is in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And I'm assuming not everyone is familiar with Canadian geography. So here's a little image showing the campus on top of a mountain. It has very nice views. And then New York City is about 3,000 miles in the direction relative to our campus. And if you're familiar with Vancouver, you might also recognize downtown Vancouver and Whistler in the back over there. <laughs> <laughs> so introduction into our lab, we are a cellular neurobiology lab focused on axonal transport, and we employ three main techniques in cell culture, live cell imaging, and in cell chemistry. So here a picture on the bottom right is an example of an immune cell chemical showing dense core vesicles, which are a Kiplone cargo, and the screen little dots there, and then you're on square company. So we are looking at the R2-3S variant, and I'll walk you through this diagram here. At the top, you can see kinesins bound to vesicles, which are the circles at the top, and microtubules on the bottom. And in the middle of the diagram here, we have a flattened out map of Kiplinger and the different domains or sections of Kiplinger. And then at the bottom is a blown up version of the motor domain, that first section there, that domain, uh, which points out our variance location, the R203S, which is within the motor domain and right outside of the ATPA's catalytic core. So we're looking at a heterozygous variant. And as Dr. Chung put it pretty well yesterday, um, she described a dominant negative mechanism. And so similar variants in similar locations of Kiplinger have been shown to work in a dominant negative fashion, where we have a sort of heterozygous dimer in the middle there with the blue and the red circles, where the blue is the wild type and then the red is the variant half of the dimer and kind of poisons the wild type version. So we're working with, of course, the induced pluripotent stem cells that um, Dylan gave a nice introduction for, or iPSCs, and they are patient-derived. So I would like to thank the patient whose cells that we're working with, as well as Dr. Chung's lab for making these cells available to the Kiplinger community, and of course, kiplinger.org for helping us acquire and work with these cells. So we generate neurons um, using a viral transduction with the transcription factor neurogenin 2. And I won't get too much into that, but basically it just produces neurons very rapidly and quickly and easily. But what we're interested in is the developmental stages from this IPSC to this neural phenotype and sort of what kind of processes go on during this sort of early development. So now I'll talk about axonogenesis, and that just basically means axon outgrowth or the formation of an axon. And it's the first step in building a nervous system. And in the top diagram, you can see sort of the stages of a neuron's development, where the small nerves will protrude from the body, and then a single axon will elongate from the cell body. And this process will produce dendrites and axons, that are functional and facilitate cell to cell communication, which will facilitate the complex circuitry that you see in your central nervous system. And behind all of this is vesicle transport. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, vesicles are just basically like packaging particles that carry proper or important cellular components. And as you can see on the bottom down below, and the, sorry, the image down below, you can see small vesicles traveling along the elongating axon, um, transporting important cellular components to the distal ends, where basically it allows axon to continue to grow and mature properly. So next, I'll talk a little bit about axon outgrowth, and I'm going to show you a couple of videos taken by my lab mate, Simon Hussain. And 
And so these videos are showing the wild type on the left and the variant on the right. And what we're looking at is videos taken with the Incusite live cell analysis, analysis system recorded at five frames per hour for about 21 hours from the start of axonogenesis. So we're looking at a very early stage of axon outgrowth. And here, hopefully you can see, I don't know how it's showing up, but the arrows denote the axon outgrowth throughout the video. And so then from videos like that, we were able to look at axon outgrowth rate and axon length. And so then what we were able to see is that in wild type and variant axogenesis occurs at similar rates. So basically we saw no significant effect from the variant on both the rate of growth of the axon within a recorded time, as well as the final length of the axon, but again, just in the recorded time of that early stage. So next I'll talk briefly about neuronal polarity and what I mean by that. So I described earlier the formation of dendrites and axons and really the that sort of differential um, specialization of different components of the neuron is driven by biochemical factors. Um, two examples are MAP2 and tau. MAP2 is segregated to the dendrites of mature neurons and tau into the axons. And again, in case you don't know, dendrites are what receive the signal from other neurons and then axons are what send out the signal from that cell body. And so again, this allows for cell communication and the proper function of our nervous system. So next we looked at a series of immunocytochemical staining, looking at these cytochemical markers, MAP2 again from the dendrites and tau from the axons. At the top, we have the wild type. At the bottom are the patient variant cells. And then on the very right is an overlay of those two images, the green and the red. And hopefully from that, what you can see is the polarity that I was talking about, meaning that there are areas of green and then areas of just red. And that's showing that these markers are being differentially distributed throughout the cell. And then that will allow for the differential maturation of these cell components. Now we're looking at vesicle populations in a similar type of experiment. Um, we're looking at chromogranin B at the top in green, which is carried by KIF1A. And now we're, and at the bottom is a control, looking at the protein Piccolo, which is carried by a different kinesin called KIF5. And if you can remember back to yesterday, where we kind of went over all the different kinesins and then how there are many that carry out many different functions. And what we saw is that vesicle populations transport distally in KIF1A are 203S neurons. So basically the allocation of these cargos was similar in both our wild type and our patient variant neurons. So now we wanted to look at why we're not seeing gross morphological differences in our wild type and our variant neurons. And so we think that a reason for this is because of the contribution of other kinesins like KIF5, which is very important in early axon outgrowth and microtubule transport. And here is just a diagram showing KIF1A carrying tubulin, which is an important cellular component in axon outgrowth. And so then now we're thinking that KIF1A becomes more important in a later stage of development than the one that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. So next, we're going to be doing some imaging of kif one and cargos in live neurons. And so this is important because transport is a very dynamic event. As we all know, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot that can go wrong as well. Um, and what I showed you before with the immunocytochemical staining was really just like a snapshot of a given time of what is going on and the allocation of those cargos. But with here, I'll go through our like typical workflow with this type of experiment where we transfect in proteins that are essential 
cargoes that are carried by KIF-1A in vesicles like dense core vesicles and synaptic vesicle precursors. And these proteins will be tagged with fluorescent proteins like GFP or RFP. And so then once they're inserted into the cell, we'll be able to track its movement along the axon and then look at the run length and speed of KIF-1A. And here's just an example of the movie of what I described. So here's just a segment of the axon. Sorry, my throat is kind of gone. Segment of the axon that's blown up. And then these black dots are a KIF-1A and the fluorescently tagged cargos that you can see moving along the axon. Okay, and so, sorry, the formatting's a little off. But so what we saw is that the early development of these variant neurons appears normal. So KIF-1A may not be required for these early stages of development. And we've seen this before with neurons cultured from knockout mice brains that have survived and maintain like quote proper morphology up to seven days in culture. And, but we know that KIF-1A cargos are needed for neuronal maturation and survival. So we're going to be looking at key neuronal maturation and survival cargos that are carried in vesicles like synaptic vesicle precursors with our lab imaging experiments. And so we hope that these findings may contribute to an understanding of when gif one function becomes critical for neuronal development and survival. And that's it. I'd like to thank my lab, of course, the gif one community, all the family and patients that are here today and on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Um, uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you for that beautiful talk. I was wondering if you are aware of any single molecule reconstituted assays with the R203S that could give insight into what is predicted to do to KIP1A? Like, does it inhibit microtubule binding or velocity, or, or et cetera? Do you know anything about that? Actually, it hasn't been super well studied before. So we, at least this particular variant. So we kind of went into it um, just with the idea of what similar variants have done in terms of decreasing um, velocity and run length of KIF-1A. Um, but besides that, we, yeah, we're open to discovery, basically. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So going off of that, there weren't any, um, like, literature about, you know, any patient that had it and they didn't do any studies about this specific mutant? Because my question was kind of the same, like, hers. Um, to my knowledge, there were some studies on like microtubule binding and stuff and like microtubule gliding assays. I don't know if any of you are familiar with yes. that. And they saw, um, again, just decrease run length. And yeah. Did they mm -hmm. discuss in the paper any clinical um, manifestations about that specific patient? Do you know? Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know too much. Um, I just know that the severe is not on the more severe side of the spectrum. It, I know that the patient was a little bit older. Um, so yeah, that's all I know though. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 so, so you didn't see any difference in drone length or in velocity with, with a wild type? Oh, well, I haven't assessed that yet. I need yeah. to do those experiments. But even when, when you see the vesicles moving. Uh, oh, oh, so I haven't done the live imaging experiments yet. So right. I don't know how the vesicles move just yet. Mm. Um, but I, we're assuming that there will be some sort of effect. Um, mm. Even if we didn't see those gross morphological differences, mm. um, there likely still is a difference in the actual motor's movement. Um, but yeah, but then it's a question of the contribution of the motor to this stage of development. And could you, in your assays in the future, differentiate if what you are looking moving is a homodimer or a heterodimer? Of mm. 
Yeah, that's a question that we have been considering, and we're not sure if we're going to be able to do that just because our, of our lab and resources, um, and it's difficult yeah. um, to isolate that and be able to see that. Um, but we're hoping, um, at least, if, you know, in like a heterozygous, heterozygous population, you're expected to see a sort of distribution of um, phenotypes. So we're hoping to at least see some sort of pattern with that. And my final question, sorry. No, if, would you be able in the future to see something like uh, synap synapsis formation between cells or things? Yeah, like we can do that. We can assess that um, okay. with immunocytochemical staining, actually. Um, we can do something called retroactive staining so we can um, look at live imaging of the cells, basically, and then we can fix them and stain them for synaptic markers. And so then we can assess the number of synapses, uh, the distribution of them, and then compare that to our um, vesicle information also. Thank you. No Thank you so much, John. Yeah.